Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Herarosaurus Ischigualistensis, as well as a lot of dinosaur news. First in the news is an article that was reported to us by our listener and former interviewee, Josh Cotton, and he pointed us to an article about stegosaurs swimming. So all of this information comes from the article, Could Stegosaurs Swim? Suggestive Evidence from the Middle Jurassic Track Site of the Cleveland Basin in Yorkshire, UK, which was published in the Geological Society of London for the Yorkshire Geological Society, and written by M. Romano and M.A. White, who passed away before it was published. So this study wasn't completely a new discovery, but it was a more detailed investigation into some tracks that were previously discovered in the Whitby area of the UK, and that's about an hour northeast of York and right on the eastern coast of England. So the tracks are described in the paper as swimming tracks, and they're all from the non-marine Saltwick Formation. And what makes them believe that they are Stegosaurus tracks is that they appear to come from the ichnotype of Delta Potus, which was previously described in other papers as a Stegosaurus. So just as some background, what an ichnotype refers to is the field of science called ichnotaxa, and that can include ichnogenera and ichno species, because, you know, taxa is just the broad term for the category, and it can vary in its specificity. So ichnotaxa means track ordering in Latin, and it refers to basing a taxon, like a species or a genus, from the, quote, work of an organism. And basically that means if you have tracks from an animal, but you haven't previously represented those tracks linked to a known species or genus, you can name a species just based on the tracks or some other non-fossilized animal matter. So the authors point out that in most cases, tracks that are made by dinosaurs and that are recovered later are made by dinosaurs while they're walking or running on land. So the researchers are quick to point out that in the past, it's been discussed that a stegosaurus may have had a lot of difficulty swimming because they have those large plates on their back and they also have spikes on their tail, which can make it difficult to swim. But they believe that their research is good enough evidence to show that stegosaurs actually could swim and probably did it fairly often. What they did was they were looking at these tracks where it appears that a stegosaurus walked into some water and then began to swim. There's one single piece of fossilized rock that has the path from land into the water and you can see the transition of the footprints. And then there are separate fossils that just have swimming fossilized prints. So when I first heard it, I was wondering how you can have a fossilized track of an animal swimming when obviously, usually when you're swimming, you're not touching ground. But what they're talking about is swimming in just deep enough water that your feet just barely graze the ground below the water enough to leave a small track mark. They also point out that in tracks that are on land, the toes kind of radiate out from a central point and when I hear that, I think of the characteristic T-Rex footprint in Jurassic Park that the water was vibrating in and how, you know, the three toes kind of point outwards from the one point. But in swimming tracks, they tend to look parallel to one another. And that's because when you're doing a swim stroke, you push back and it would just be like the tips of the toes grazing in a path and not a full print of the entire foot. So they found some prints that look like these parallel marks and they match the same size and pattern as the prints that are not parallel from the land. And then they also found that the material that was fossilized to make the footprint was composed of material that would have only been found in lakes, specifically lakes, not rivers and not floodwaters. And they think that's significant because if a stegosaurus is swimming through just a typical lake, that means that it would have probably done it as a normal practice. If it was swimming through floodwaters or swimming through a river, it may have just done it to get from one place to another or to get out of a bad situation. But if it's doing it in a lake, that means that it's probably doing it just because it's one of the things it does. <laughs> 
They also noted that they never found any track marks from its front legs, and that may have been because when it was swimming, since its front legs are shorter than its back legs, its front legs wouldn't have touched the ground when it was swimming, and it's also because it needed to keep its head above water, so if it kept its head out of the water, it would have had to raise its front legs up a little bit higher, and it gave them some ideas for what it might have looked like while it was swimming. So it'll be interesting to see if anybody posts any peer review comments to that, like a story we're going to talk about in a little bit, because sometimes they get kind of heated. So speaking of relatively controversial science stories, there have been a couple articles published in the journal Science discussing the relative body temperature of dinosaurs. Just as a little bit of background, in common language we discuss animals as being either warm-blooded or cold-blooded, but that's not really an accurate description of what they are. I think we talked about this on a previous podcast. The real question is whether or not an animal maintains its body temperature at a metabolically favorable value. Endotherms, which is something that people call warm-blooded, are like humans, all other mammals, and all modern birds. They maintain their body temperature in a very specific value that keeps them in peak condition for all sorts of activities and growth and high energy activities. But what ectotherms do is they have to get energy from external sources, and very little of their body temperature comes from internal sources like movement or internal heat. So about one year ago, there was an article published in the journal Science titled Evidence for Mesothermy in Dinosaurs by John M. Grady and a few other scientists. So at the time, he acknowledged that most of the strong evidence for dinosaurs points to them being endotherms, but that comes from the fact that they are growing at very fast rates. This is a trait that's typical of endotherms because growing quickly requires a sustained high energy, and that's difficult for an ectotherm to maintain since they have to rely on outside sources which are less reliable. I didn't mention earlier, but a mesotherm is somewhere in between an ectotherm and an endotherm, and describing what's an endotherm and a mesotherm gets a little bit of a gray area, because endotherms and ectotherms are already not super clearly defined. But there were a couple comments on his peer-reviewed article. One was by Michael de Emick, and another was by Nathan P. Mirvold, and they were both published separately, not as co-authors. But the thing they have in common is they call into question Grady's somewhat controversial notion that dinosaurs were mesotherms, and they point out that Grady and his team used an annualized average growth rate which is not really typical. So they point out that what Grady was doing was he was saying if a Tyrannosaurus rex was going to grow from an egg up to its full-grown size and it was going to have a certain growth pattern, that it could do so without being a pure endotherm. It could get enough energy without controlling its own body temperature 100% of the time to a really exacting degree based on the average growth rate that it needed. But... What the other scientists are saying is that animals don't grow at the same rate over years and years of time. What they're saying is, just like humans, if you've ever seen the studies, when kids are going through puberty, they grow the most on summer vacation because they're sleeping more and whatever other factors are going on, maybe they're eating more, etc. But it's seen across animal species as well. So if you take an annualized approach, it may have, on average, enough energy to maintain that growth rate, but the animal might not be trying to grow during the entire year. So you might have to look at an individual season and see if in that season it would have enough energy to grow at that rate. And the two scientists who published responses are saying that if you look at it that way, they had to be endotherms because for these sustained short growth periods, they would have to have a lot of energy available that they wouldn't have available as a mesotherm. Grady also asserted that these high temperatures could have caused problems and limited their size if they were pure endotherms. But the other scientists are arguing that the air sacs that we've talked about before that may have been in their bodies, as well as the hollow bones, would have helped them to maintain lower body temperatures. So that may not have been as big of a limiting factor as Grady mentions. So then, 
<laughs> Two days ago, Grady and his co-authors published a response to the comments on his original piece saying that his statistics and his analysis were in fact accurate and he still believes the animals to be mesotherms and does not agree with the comments on his paper. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this pans out, but I would like to note that even though there isn't a consensus on whether they're mesotherms or endotherms, I couldn't find any modern paleontologist calling them ectotherms or cold-blooded, which was the prevailing theory for a long period of time when they were thought to be lizards and all that. I think at this point we're kind of splitting hairs a little bit between mesotherms and endotherms, but it's still an important question because it does impact their growth rate and their overall body temperature. I'm interested to see if there's a comment to the response. <laughs> My favorite news piece, <laughs> if I can pick favorites, from this week was published in the PLOS One journal. That might be partly why I like it so much because PLOS One is open so I could actually read the whole thing. <laughs> but it's titled laser stimulated fluorescence in paleontology and lasers are awesome so that also helps me like it more but it's published by thomas gk and some other scientists who worked on this with him they discussed that using uv light as a tool in paleontology to make specimens fluoresce or glow has become a very useful tool this is the same kind of thing that you see when you're under a black light and your white shirt glows it's fluorescing in response to the the light but these researchers are using, quote, laser-stimulated fluorescence, abbreviated LSF, to light up specimens that don't fluoresce under a typical UV bulb. They outline five different ways that they used LSF to learn something that they couldn't find without using their new technique or without using some really expensive piece of equipment like an X-ray or a CT scan. Their setup took advantage of relatively low cost and low power lasers, digital photography, and typical photography filters. The filters that they use are necessary to prevent the camera from getting overpowered from the laser light, and instead they filter out the light that's projected by the laser and only absorb what's emitted by the fluorescing fossil. So the way fluorescence works in this case is when you hit the fossil with a uh, high energy laser, it excites the molecules in the material of the fossil, and depending on what the material is, it lights up different colors, it fluoresces different colors. So you can shine a light, basically, on something, filter out the light that's shining, and just see what the material itself is. And this is something that they use a little bit in astronomy. They obviously can't shine a light on it, but they can measure the fluorescence of different astronomical bodies and try to measure what material it might be made out of. They indicate that more powerful lasers give better results, but if they use too powerful of a laser, they can get, cause decay of the samples. So they stuck to lasers that were one half a watt and below. <laughs> so it looked like their most common setup was a tripod with a camera on it and a filter to filter out the laser light that was pointed at a specimen and then they would shine a laser on it in as dark a room as possible so that they took out as much interference and they would do a real long exposure using the camera like several seconds to a minute so that they could absorb as much as the fluorescence because some of these things don't fluoresce that much so you have to have a long exposure to capture all the light of the fluorescence. They also set up a really cool laser scanning tool. So they, they got a laser that projects a straight line down, and then they could scan it using a motor on the, beneath the laser that would rotate, and the camera would take a picture the whole time, and you would end up with a fluorescent image of the entire large fossil that you wouldn't be able to do with a standard little laser that just puts a little point spot on it. And then the last way that they set up was a laser which was pointed at a specimen underneath a microscope and they could use that to get really detailed pictures of these fossils. So I want to talk about the five examples that they tried this out on because I think they're all really fascinating. The first one was they wanted to examine what they call a carbonized structure and that encompasses a ton of different materials from leaves and feathers and all sorts of stuff. But in this case they were looking at a feather from the Green River Formation they looked at it under SEM and UV light and polarized light, and they couldn't find out much about it. They thought it was a feather imprint, but they couldn't see too much. 
But what they really wanted to do was backlight it. Unfortunately, to backlight a fossil, you have to cut it really thin and then obviously shine a light through the back of it. That's not really practical because you might be cutting into the fossil if you're thinking there's something inside it. So instead, they decided to use their LSF technique. When they did their LSF, what they found was all the barbs sticking out of a feather really clearly, which gave them lots of detail into this feather that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to see, which is pretty awesome, especially considering all of the recent news about dinosaurs having feathers. If this makes it easier to find more feathers, that would be super useful and cool. The second example was they were trying to identify a specimen near a Microraptor fossil, and part of that was you might be able to identify what the Microraptor would have eaten or what it lived around and all that kind of stuff. They looked at it under lots of different types of light and other things, and they couldn't figure out what it was, so they gave it to this team as sort of a last resort, and the team almost immediately figured out exactly what it was, basically within minutes. They put it under their LSF, and they saw scales on the surface that were really faint, but you could kind of see them. Once you knew they were there, you could kind of tell they were there, but they lit up just real bright under their LSF. And then they even found a couple of teeth that were buried slightly in the fossil, and they could tell that they were fish teeth. So they were like, oh, that's fish. That's what it is. And they could even count the growth rings on the scale to tell more information about the fish. A lot more information out of that fossil than you would normally get. The third way is something that I've never heard of, but real paleontologists probably hear about it all the time. <laughs> and there are these things called microfossils. So it turns out that ants carry specific grain sizes back to their anthill, and they choose them based on the size of their tunnels in their anthill. And through this process, ants inadvertently concentrate small fossils of a certain size uh, near their anthill. And paleontologists like to look at these for instance, if you're looking at plants or something, you can get a lot of small plant fossils out of it. But the only way that they had found to sort these before was using UV light or manually. And using UV light only works in certain formations. And it turns out that the Hell Creek formation didn't have the right type of minerals in it to allow UV light to fluoresce the material. So basically, they're looking for a way to filter out the fossils of interesting things, the organic matter, the leaves, the whatever, versus just little pebbles and other stuff that happened to be in the area but wasn't actually collected by the ants or otherwise isn't interesting. So what they did is they took these Hell Creek Formation microfossils that didn't fluoresce under UV light but put them under the LSF and all of a sudden they lit up bright as day when they were something interesting and didn't light up at all when they weren't. It went from a process of person having to manually put a few of these grains underneath a microscope and stare at them for a while and try to see if they could find patterns or textures on them that would show it was a fossil to just shining a light on it to point them out. And then what they did was they put just a whole heap of them into an automated microfossil sorter, which was a camera, a laser, and a bowl feeder, which is basically a big hopper and then a computer that controlled a little air puff as they passed through a chute out of the bowl feeder, and they automatically sorted a whole pile of these little microfossils. And the paleontologists who wrote this article believe that it's the first ever automated fossil sorter. So it's kind of cool that you can put a whole pile of these in there, you shine a light on it, if it lights up, you know it's a fossil, you shoot it off to the side, and if it doesn't light up, you just dump it out into the waste bin. That's pretty awesome, and apparently it they think it's going to save tons of time, help with their bottleneck of incoming fossils. The next case has nothing to do with dinosaurs, but I think it's interesting enough to mention just because. So there was a bracelet around a fossilized human girl that they found in Africa, and they weren't able to remove the bracelet from the girl's wrist, you know, for one of many reasons, but they could get up close to it and kind of examine it, they couldn't fit it into their rig, and they didn't have the right equipment with them anyway. So what they did was they just put it in a dark room. They got a laser pointer and a digital SLR with the right filter on it, and someone stood there and manually drew the laser pointer back and forth across this bracelet a bunch of times while taking a long exposure. And then they looked at the resulting picture, and they could tell that it had some characteristic cracks in it that aligned with their theory that it was a hippopotamus tusk. <laughs> it 
So they didn't even need their fancy setup for that one. They just used a little handheld laser pointer in their camera. And then the last one is back to the dinosaurs. So four out of five from a group that isn't specifically focused on dinosaurs is pretty good. It's a fossil of a microraptor skull that appeared to be a composite. So it's basically a skull with a crack going through the substrate, the rock that it's buried in, right through the middle of the skull. And one side of it looked a slight different color than the other side, but it wasn't clear enough to tell whether it was a composite, and they couldn't tell if the crack was along the same type of sediment from the same place or if they were two pieces glued together. So they lit it with the LSF, and the two parts of the fossil lit up completely different colors, which indicated that they were composed of different minerals, and the boundary of where the different minerals were matched exactly with the crack in the rock, not with the natural boundaries of the different parts of the skull, which was a really strong indicator that it was probably two different fossils that were put together to look like one fossil. It's not perfect evidence, so they're going to do a little bit more analysis on it, but it was a very cost-effective way to do a quick analysis of it, and now they can go put it in much more expensive tools since they think they're on the right track. The authors say they hope this will have a big impact on the paleontology industry, and they say that you could set up a whole rig of this for as little as $500. It comes mostly from the fact that these medium to low powered lasers have gotten much cheaper over the last few years, and digital photography is so ubiquitous that you can get a good DSLR and the right filters since they're used in astronomy, they're commonly available for very little cost. And if you already have a digital SLR, I'm guessing you can just get a laser pointer and the right filter and probably get going for about 100 bucks. so pretty cool. We're all done with these really heavy <laughs> scientific articles, but there's still some cool things that are going on. The Hanksville Burpee Dig Site, which is located in Utah, has just started offering free tours again this season. And it's actually their seventh year running that they're doing that, according to the Salt Lake Tribune. The Bureau of Land Management has authorized them to open it up for public viewing, and the Rockford, Illinois-based Burpee Museum has the staff that's on site and is providing the tours, which are free. So if you're nearby, you should go there. I definitely would. <laughs> I don't know how many people are nearby, though. I kind of think it's the middle of nowhere in Utah. Maybe Salt Lake City isn't too far out. The Pixar Times, I don't know if that's officially affiliated with Pixar or not, <laughs> but they reported some new details about the upcoming movie, The Good Dinosaur, or maybe it's just Good Dinosaur. They refer to it as both names within the article, so I don't know. But if you haven't heard about it, it's a story that talks about the relationship between a dinosaur and his pet boy. <laughs> Disney had originally planned to release the movie about a year ago, and then for some reason they scrapped everything that they had done on it and reworked the story completely from the beginning. I can't remember the details of what the story was before, but I do know that John Lithgow voices one of the characters. That's great. Without giving out any spoilers, because there aren't any spoilers available at all yet, John Lasseter, who's been involved with Pixar for a long time as one of the creative geniuses, <laughs> said that, quote, this is a boy and dog story, but the roles are reversed. Arlo the dinosaur is the boy in the story, and Spot the human is the dog, meaning that Arlo stands upright and speaks while Spot travels on his hands and feet and grunts, <laughs> which should be awesome. And I'm wondering... They said that there are going to be a few other dinosaurs in the movies, T-Rexes, Pterodactyls, and Velociraptors, and I'm hoping that the Velociraptors are the small feathered ones and not the Deinonychus ones. But I'm wondering what kind of conversations they're going to have between the T-Rex, Pterodactyls, Velociraptor, and it looked like some kind of sauropod that the main dinosaur is. So maybe they can talk to each other, probably, given it's a Pixar movie. Maybe they'll all look for their own Great Valley. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Disney's last dinosaur movie was basically a remake of Land Before Time, but with 3D dinosaurs. It was called Dinosaurs. It wasn't nearly as good. No, but it was still pretty good. <laughs> yeah. All right. But speaking of dinosaur movies, we have to have some Jurassic World news since it's coming out here in about 12 days. 
Sabrina and I already got our tickets, by the way. So They're selling out fast. Yeah, we should get on that. This website called Truck Yeah, which I guess is just all about truck-related things, published a little article about the Mercedes Benzes that are going to be in the new Jurassic World movie. And they also pointed out that in Jurassic Park The Lost World, there were a lot of Mercedes-Benz vehicles all over the place. In the beginning when InGen, is that the company, was coming in and they were riding on their SUVs and they were catching the Pachycephalosaurus and all the other little dinosaurs running around, they were all in modified Mercedes-Benz M-Class SUVs. And then later on, they were in a similar vehicle. I don't remember what the guy's name is, but the guy there was a guy trying to prevent the RV from going off the cliff and he tied the thing to the back of his SUV, and he's driving and flooring it, and then the two T-Rexes come up, and one of them meets him. He was in a Mercedes-Benz there, too. So it seems like Mercedes-Benz and Jurassic Park are just best of pals. But uh, <laughs> in Jurassic World, it looks like they're going to make a mobile veterinary unit, and apparently that's going to be for taking care of sick or injured dinosaurs, and it's this big, you know, super manly-looking vehicle, so it'll be interesting to see how they use that, too. And last but not least, there's a new exhibit opening up in Alaska at the Museum of the North, and according to Newsminer.com, the University of Alaska Museum of the North is going to be all about animals and plants that lived in Alaska during the age of dinosaurs. It's going to be called Expedition Alaska Dinosaurs, and it's going to have Tons of never-before-displayed specimens from museum expeditions during the last decade. And that's going to include several fossils that have never been displayed publicly before and some new artwork and interactive displays. And it just opened, and it's going to be open through May of 2016. And that's all the news we have for today. Now for our dinosaur of the day, Herrerasaurus Ischiguela stensis, which was requested from Brenna via Facebook, so... Thanks for the request, Brenna. Herrerasaurus means Herrera's lizard, and it's named after the rancher Don Victorino Herrera, who found the first Herrerasaurus fossil in 1958, and it was found in the Isquigualasto Formation of northwestern Argentina. So researchers found three partial skeletons, and Osvaldo A. Reg named Herrerasaurus in 1963. A Harvard paleontologist named Alfred Romer also found a partial Herrerasaurus in the late 1950s, but unfortunately local authorities impounded them in Buenos Aires for two years until Harvard claimed them. So Herrerasaurus lived in the Triassic period about 235 to 230 million years ago, and it's one of the earliest dinosaurs, an early archosaur. Although Herrerasaurus is one of the earliest dinosaurs, there was in 2012 some news stories that researchers may have discovered the earliest dinosaur, called Neosaurus perringtoni, a dinosaur that lived 10 million years before Herrerasaurus. It was the size of a Labrador retriever with a five-foot-long tail. And the team was from UC Berkeley, and they say that they are cautious about calling it the earliest dinosaur, though. Neosaurus was excavated in the 1930s in Tanzania, but these researchers had found bone cells and blood vessels in the bones. Herrerasaurus was kind of a controversial dinosaur in terms of how it was classified. Some scientists saw it as a sister to dinosaurs, others saw it as a saurischian, and others a theropod. Today, it seems like the consensus is Herrerasaurus is a basal theropod. But what happened was, even though Herrerasaurus was named in the 1960s, it was re-described in the Journal of Vertebrae Paleontology in 1988. This is based on new fossils that Paul Sereno of the University of Chicago and his team found, which included the first skull. The skull is similar to other archosaur forms, such as Euparcaria. Serrano and his team thought that this new material made Herrerasaurus a theropod, but others saw the material as proof that it was something else. They all seemed to agree that it was a carnivore, but there's heated debates over whether it was a basal theropod or a carnivorous saurischian or maybe even something earlier in the evolutionary tree, maybe not even a dinosaur. So one of the reasons for this is Herrerasaurus had an unusual pelvis. It lacks a bone in the center of its hip socket, which is a key characteristic of dinosaurs. 
However, in 2009, a new early theropod called Tawa was discovered and described, and Tawa kind of proved that Herrerasaurus was actually an early theropod. This is because Tawa was similar in some ways to Herrerasaurus. So Herrerasaurus had large claws and teeth like theropods, but in addition to the unusual pelvis, it didn't have air sac pockets in its vertebrae, which is unusual for a theropod. And Tawa was similar to Herrerasaurus, they had a similar pelvis, but it had air sac pockets in the backbone, just like other theropods. So this seems to prove that Herrerasaurus was a theropod because despite having this unusual characteristics, it wasn't unique in terms of its pelvis. One of the scientists in the study said that categorizing Herrerasaurus as a theropod shows that dinosaurs quickly evolved into three lineages. There's the sauropods, ornithischians, and theropods, and all three of these were found in South America, where Herrerasaurus was found, almost as soon as dinosaurs appeared. Herrerasaurus' type species has a couple synonyms, such as Ischisaurus and Fringuellosaurus. This is because there was one large, what's now known as a Herrerasaurus specimen, that was first thought to be a new genus, and Fernando Novas named it in 1986 Fringuellosaurus. But in 1992, Novas and Paul Sereno reclassified it as Herrerasaurus. Herrerasaurus was about 13 feet or 3.9 meters long, 4 feet or 1.1 meters tall at the hips, and weighed about 460 pounds or 210 kilograms. It may have been cathomeral, which means it was active throughout the day in short intervals, and it was bipedal with long legs and a long tail. It was probably pretty quick and agile, which would have made it easy to catch animals it scared out of hiding. This is because of its long legs, so it could have caught smaller dinosaurs and have been one of the few predators at the time who could actually catch them. Other predators at the same time were too stocky or heavy. So the leg bones had a proportionately short femur and long lower leg bones, and Herrerasaurus walked on its toes to also extend the length of its leg. Its pubis was pointed backwards, which you see in modern birds, so again, it was probably agile and very fast. Herrerasaurus had a small head and a long, narrow skull, and its wrist and lower arm resembles modern birds. For example, its forelimbs could fold up like a pigeon's, and it may have also had feathers. Herrerasaurus had short arms and sharp claws, as well as sharp teeth, so it probably hunted small reptiles and smaller dinosaurs. It had blade-shaped teeth with knife-like serrations, and scientists have found small bones in Herrerasaurus coprolites, which means that they could have digested bone. Herrerasaurus had a sliding lower jaw, which you see in other reptiles, and that means it may have raked its teeth through its prey, or it could have held struggling small prey in its jaws. Its body was shaped like large carnivores, such as Allosaurus, which came later, but Herrerasaurus lived in a time when dinosaurs were small and not the dominant animals. So although it was fairly large, it probably wasn't the top predator in its habitat. It lived among bigger predators, like a giant crocodile relative, Saurosuchus, and puncture wounds have been found in one Saurosuchus skull, so they may have fought, and Fossilosuchus tenax, which was the largest meat eater in Argentina at the time. However, Herrerasaurus was probably the most common carnivore in the Isquigualasto Formation, and the Isquigualasto Formation was a volcanically active floodplain with forests and strong seasonal rainfalls. It's a moist, warm climate, and it had a lot of vegetation, including ferns, horsetails, and giant conifers, and these formed some forests along the banks of rivers. Herrerasaurus is part of the Herrerasaurid group, and they're some of the oldest known dinosaurs. They lived in the late Triassic, but they were extinct by the end of the Triassic. They were small and carnivorous, and fossils have been found in North and South America, though they may have also lived on other continents. They have an unusual anatomy with both primitive and derived traits, and their family has two other genera, Strigosaurus, which was found in Brazil, and San Juansaurus, which was found in Argentina. Our fun fact of the day relates to Richard Owen, and we've mentioned him before in that he's the one that coined the term dinosaur back in 1842, and it's commonly known that dinosaur means terrible lizard, but they weren't lizards. <laughs> but it turns out that when he said dinosaur, he may not have even meant terrible. So the word dinos is an ancient Greek word, and according to some sources I could find, it's one of those bittersweet kind of words where you're trying to describe something in nature and life 
that can be both positive and negative. So another way to say dinos is wondrous or fearfully great, kind of, you know, like imposing. And that's probably what Richard Owen meant when he wrote Dinosaur for the first time. Not that it was terrible, like mean, but that it was just amazing and awe-inspiring. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.